This is the word of God. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, for I, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had me set, set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in the persons in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They, they only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. This is the word of God. Now, there's, during the coming retreat, in the plenary meetings, in the entire meetings, we will have some of our members, the Lord willing, come up and share their great story. In other words, their testimony, the testimony of God's grace in their life. So I contacted some of our members this past week to arrange that. Mm. But here in this text, what we read this morning, we see Paul's testimony. Paul shares his grace story here. So what we're going to do this morning is this. One, we will look into the Paul's story, his grace story. Some of you are maybe familiar with it. Some of you are not. So we will look into the first. And secondly, we will now look into why Paul shared this story here. Why Paul shared his story. That's the number two part. And number three, and then we will draw, I will try to draw some of the points from the text and try to show it to us how and why they are relevant to you and me and to us. Good, that's the three part we're going to do. So number one, Paul's great story. Let's look into the what happened. Paul's story. Would you look at verse 13? I know we read already this morning, but let's try to read it slowly and go over this text with me. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism. This is Paul's story. My former life, what it was like. How I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. But when he who has set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. In order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Pause right there. Now, maybe some of you are familiar with Paul's story. Paul's life story and his story of conversion we find in the book of Acts. And you can see from the Acts chapter 9. Formerly, Paul persecuted the church and killing many Christians. But when he was going on his way to the city, a place called Damascus, and to do the same work, and Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, appeared to him in the bright light, and he fell from his horse, and he became blind, and he was talking with Jesus, who are you? I'm the Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul saw also, why are you persecuting me? And the people around him didn't see anything, but they only heard the voice. And Paul was taken by them because he became blind and to the city of Damascus. He was there for three days, blind, not eating, not drinking anything. And the Lord appeared to the name guy named Ananias, his servant. Go to a certain, certain house. You will find the guy named Saul. Lay your hand on him and pray for him. And that happened. And when he laid his hand on Saul, he regained, Paul regained his sight. That's Saul's conversion story. You can find this story in Acts chapter 9. And after he gained his sight and after the conversion, 
Paul started to go to synagogues in Damascus, the Jewish synagogues, and he started to preach to the people that Jesus, he is the Son of God. And the Jewish people didn't like, did not like it. So they plotted to kill Paul. You will find that in Acts chapter 9. And let me show you what happened after that. It's going to be on the screen. Acts chapter 9, verse 24. But their plot, so Jewish people trying to kill Paul, became known to Saul. Saul is Paul's former name. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciple took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And that's how Paul escaped from the city of Damascus. And then the book of Acts chapter 9 jumps to this story, verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciple, blah, 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 blah. But here in Galatians, this letter that Paul was writing, we get the story in between, between Paul's escape from Damascus and Paul's arrival coming to Jerusalem, we get the story of what happened, the gap in between. Paul did not come to Jerusalem right away. There was a gap in between those two. Look at verse 16 of our text. Look at, go back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 16. Right? Jesus was revealed to me in order that I might preach to him among the Gentiles. Let's continue. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. See, Paul is saying, I did not go to Jerusalem right away. I did not. To those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia. Where did he go? He said, I went to Arabia. And returned again to Damascus, and after three years, Three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So we get here what happened in the gap between Paul's left Damascus and Paul coming to Jerusalem, which book of Acts skips. Paul is providing and filling the gap. I went to Arabia and came back and three years later. I took three years and then I went to Jerusalem. And when I went to Jerusalem, there was no other apostle. You know, the, all these apostles, the disciples of Jesus, they already left Jerusalem. The only two people I met was Peter was there and James, Jesus' brother. The James, you know, when Pastor Mike was here, he went over the book of James. That James, the author of the book of James, the first pastor of the church of Jerusalem, that James, those two are the only people I met in Jerusalem. Now that's Paul's story, what we find here. So number two, second part. Why Paul share that story here? Why? Paul highlights that he did not consult with any apostles or any leaders right away. He did not go to Jerusalem to right away to check his gospel, his understanding of Christ with Apostle Peter, nor to learn from Apostle Peter. In other words, Paul is saying, that is not where I got my gospel from. That's the point he's making. Paul says, I spent three years before I went to Jerusalem to see any other apostles. Probably during that time, Paul learned and understood the gospel of Christ, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. As you can see in our text, verse 12, he got his gospel through the revelation. Got all of his understanding of Christ, in other words, his Christology, was set during the three-year time. Actually, I'm wondering, this is, a, is this the reason why the seminary school to be a pastor, you got to study three, four years? I'm the kind of guy who couldn't finish in three years. I took four years. I mean, Paul was already an expert in the Old Testament because he was a Pharisee. He knew his Bible. But he began to see probably during the time how Jesus fulfills all the Old Testament promises and prophecies. He got it. And Paul did not come to Jerusalem in order to be appointed to be an apostle by Peter, but he came to Jerusalem already as an apostle. Let them recognize 
that I am an apostle just like them. The gospel I got from Christ Jesus through his revelation is just like theirs. Paul wanted to come and confirm that with other apostles, not to be appointed as an apostle by Peter. So, again, we looked into this last Sunday, if you were with me. Those false teachers in Galatian church, the false teachers who came to Galatian church, Try to nullify Paul's gospel. Oh, the Paul's gospel is wrong. You need, still need to do this. Oh, we even question the Paul is oh, genuinely really apostle or not. Oh, no. No, Paul's reasoning against that, that, well, my gospel is not from a man. It's not human origin. It was not taught by men, as you can see, verse 12. Paul is not, I am not promoting human religion. This gospel I'm preaching has a divine origin. Actually, guess what? That was not even my plan, not my ideas. He's saying here, I was not trying to advance the gospel of Christ Jesus. I was not promoting the church or Christianity. I was not for that at all. I was advancing in Judaism, trying to kill and destroy Christianity. I was so zealous about the traditions of my father's. Why I became like this? God did this to me. His message changed me. Now, my friends, let's pause right here. And let me tell you what this means to you. You can dismiss this guy, Paul, as a swindler, as a liar, a bad imposter, who tried to deceive the world to try to deceive all the other people with his message, the fake message, false message. And this guy devoted his life to do that. But would you think with me, do you think a liar, a swindler, would do that? Devoting his life to deceive others to the point of being beaten up nearly to death? in order to preserve that lie? Knowing that if you go around and preach this gospel, what are you going to get? What you're going to face is nothing but suffering, abandonment, being hungry, thirsty, being poor, even the risk of putting to death. Would you? All for that line, I mean, all the cult leaders you see, cult leaders deceiving other people with false teachings, they deceive other people for their own well-being, for their riches, to accumulate their riches, or the, for their fame, for their comfort, or for their lust, their desires, not for the, uh, the completely opposite effect of that. If Paul compromised the gospel, and if Paul just changed the gospel a little tiny bit in a way that those false teachers would like to see, yeah, 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 just this, yeah, I like that, in a way that Jewish people would like, then Paul didn't have to suffer. He knew that he didn't have to go through all those bad things. He just needed to compromise and change the gospel a little tiny bit. He knows that. But he didn't. He couldn't change the gospel. Why? Because this gospel was from God. So there is no compromise in the gospel Paul is preaching. I cannot compromise and change this gospel. If he's not a wicked imposter, then is Paul just a delusional fool? Is he just a crazy guy? But when you read all his writing in the New Testament, he wrote a lot of books in the New Testament. When you read his writing and seeing his knowledge and his wisdom and his logic and reasoning and his insight, well, yet, would you still conclude that he's just a crazy man? With all his influence in the church all over the world and throughout the Christian church history, he's just a crazy fool, would you? Or otherwise, would you say that the gospel he preaches, the reason he devoted his life even to that point was actually because the gospel was from 
above. The message he preached was from above. What you must know, what you must believe, what you must hold on to for your eternal salvation. And he testified that same gospel that he's preaching to you changed his life completely upside down. I was on that way, now I'm like this. That same message changed me too. So, number three, part three. What do we learn from this text? What do we learn? So I'm going to give you three points, little tiny three points right here. What do we learn? One, God sets apart Paul not only for his salvation, but also for his apostleship even before his birth. That's what we see in this text. Let me point that out. Would you go and look at verse 15 and 16 with me? Look at verse 15 and 16. But when he who has sent me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace and was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. The last part basically is saying to be apostle to the Gentiles. Now listen to me. It was not, it was not, not like God saw the Christians in Jerusalem, in Judea area, and it's like, oh, what else should I do? These Christians are lingering around in Jerusalem and they are not leaving Jerusalem. They are not taking the gospel to the Gentiles, to the nations. Oh, I need to come up with a better plan now. You know what? I got an idea. Let me go with the plan B. Let me pick someone who is passionate enough to do that task for me. Oh, Saul! He's a good candidate. He's a passionate guy. So let me change this guy's soul and let me use him for that task. Is that what happened? Paul says, no. That is not what happened. Let it be clear that Paul being an apostle for the Gentile was not the plan B or second thought in the mind of God. Why Paul is going all the way back to the eternity, before he was born, before anything, eternity, to defend his apostleship, to defend his gospel as God's originated. Paul is saying this, that's where my apostleship began. I am not a self-appointed apostle, nor I am appointed by Peter, then appointed to be apostle by who? God. My apostleship began with God from the eternity back. God chose me not only for my salvation, for my apostleship, to be his servant, to do this task even before I was born. Now, church, are you with me? Now, think about this implication. Because you know, all believers, that this is true also for you. For you believers as well. Paul says so many places in the Bible and the scriptures tells us that God knew you even before you were formed in your mother's womb. God chose you to be in Christ, to be his people, his children, into the eternal salvation from all eternity by his grace from the eternity past. And but obviously, church, not for the apostleship itself. I mean, we are not called to be apostle, right? That was not God's plan he had for you or me. That's the Paul's case. But think with me. What you are doing today for the kingdom of God, all of you who are serving the body of Christ, whatever that may be, and even being a part of a member of Hope of Glory, those of you who are joining this to be part of the Hope of Glory, this body of Christ, was not an accident. Deacons, deaconess, and elders, and people who are serving the praise team, all serving food, whatever they might be, serving the body of Christ as a teacher or so, was not an accident. It was not like 
God's plan B is the second thought. Let, let me, oh, I need a teacher for children ministry. Oh, I need someone to play this instrument for the church. I need someone to serve food for my hope of glory church. Oh, oh, he might be good. Oh, she might be good. Oh, yeah, let, why not? Let's change him and use him for that. That was not what happened. He chose you to be his instrument of grace, to serve his kingdom for his name, the body of Christ. He set that plan apart before you were born, and in time, he called you to himself to be an instrument of his grace, and that is now being unfolded in your life. Though you did not see it till now, God has set you apart to be instrument of his grace even before you existed. How God is using you in and for the body of Christ for his name was not an accident and it was not originated from you. It was not because would you serve our youth group as a teacher and it's simply you was like, yes, I decided to do that. No, it was not originated from you. You want to be part of a hope of glory as a member and serve this church, your pe- God's people? And it's like, I decided. No, you are not the origin of that. God planned it even before you were born. Rooted in that eternal reality he had for you. And would you, if it is so, think with me. Think about this. God chose Paul to be his apostle even before his birth. But, this is number two part. God permitted Paul being a murderer of his children in his life. Why? If God chose him to be an apostle, to be his instrument of grace, even before Paul was born, he had that plan. Then why not calling him at the age of 10? Why not calling him at the age of 15? And then that we will save many Christian lives. They will save lives of many of God's children. Paul wouldn't kill them. Then why he waited? On Paul being a murderer of his children. Why God was willing to put up with all Paul's sin and evil and mess he created. Do you think God did not know what Paul was coming, becoming? God chose Paul not just for his own salvation, but to be an apostle. He knew it. And Paul shares here in the same text. He chose me for that, yet I was a murderer. Destroyer of God's people. You can ask the same thing about yourself. If God chose me in Christ even before my birth, as the scripture says, he chose me, then why was he willing to put up with all my sins and mess that I made in my life until I come to him? All those messes I created all those hurts I gave to other people, all the mockings that I had against God, all the blasphemies, and all the brokenness and chaos and pains I made. Why? Now, one thing is clear. That tells me that he did not choose me based on my positive, good merits. He did not. He chose you as his in Christ Jesus even before you students. Are you with me? Youth? He chose you even before you showed any sign of faith or belief. He did not choose you. Like, Let me see, Billy. Oh, he's showing some sign of faith. He's going to repent. Oh, I see it. Let me choose him. I know some places they teach this. Because God chose you because you showed, oh, he knew that you're going to believe in him. You showed some sort of sign that you're going to have a faith in him. So he's like, I choose you. 
That is not what happened. The transformation of your life started with God. Let me clean up my life. Let me change, transform my heart and myself. Then God will choose me. Bible says, no. He chose me. And transformation, change happens. My transformation starts with God and started from God. Because of his election, choosing you before the foundation of the world, that is why calling happened in your life, calling you to him. And as you come to him, you are changing by him. While you were still going to the completely opposite direction, just like Paul. Paul is saying, I was advancing in Judaism. I was advancing not in Jesus, not in life. You know, while I was advancing, I was so zealous for killing, murder, death, sin, destructions. I was advancing in those things. Yet, Paul says here in this text, God was pleased to reveal his son to me. You and I, we were advancing in sin in completely opposite directions. Yet God was pleased to reveal His Son Jesus to you through the Holy Spirit. And that is why, for some reason that you cannot explain, you cannot tell. It's like, I don't know what it is, but I, I, I know Jesus is real. I know God is there. I know there is heaven, hell. I know there is a judgment. I, I, I believe it. I believe that he really lived and died and rose again. I get it. He opened your eyes to his grace that you did not see. The reality that he chose you is now you are, your eyes are opening to that. And somehow, from one day, what pastors are talking about up there is making sense to me. I get it. I want to know more. I want to know more. That calling and that conversion and that transformation happened because there was this grace of election from the eternity past. And let me show you this from what Paul says in another place. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Now look carefully with me, church. Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. In other words, appointing me to his service means to the apostleship. Paul is having. Though, verse 13, formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted in faith. Is that what you see? No, that's not what you see. Oh, I received mercy because God showed me and he saw some sort of sign of belief, faith in me, from me. So he's like, oh, I'll show you mercy. That is not what Paul says. I mean, that makes sense. But Paul says, I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. There's nothing based, originated from me. This is not based on me. Then based on who? Why? Verse 14. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love. That's how I got faith and love. Because of His grace. There are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Let this be known to you, all of you, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Paul is saying, I am the worst guy. Anybody can compete? I killed God's children. I'm a murderer of God's children. Verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason. What is the reason? That in me, as the former, the worst guy, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And that is why. You're asking the question, if God chose Paul from all eternity before he was even born, why God was willing to put up with all that? And Paul says, this is a reason. 
so that Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience to all those who will believe in him, those, to all those who will come to Christ. It was a display of God's scale of patience. Brothers, sisters, we are not perfect parent, parents, if those of you have parents, and even if you are not parents, you can understand this. Sinners as we are, and imperfect love as sinful men, we have for children, even us, we cannot watch our children being tortured and killed. How much more God who is perfect in his love towards his children. Why God was willing to put up with Paul killing his children. He showed his God's scale of perfect patience and he withheld his wrath. So Paul calls it that kind of patience. I call it perfect patience. God's scale of patience. And Paul thinks that is what's going on in this world. It is because of God's perfect patience, God did not kill Paul. And it is because of God's perfect patience that he is exercising towards you and me. That's why God did not kill you. That's why you are alive. That's why I'm alive. Sometimes people ask this question. If God is almighty and he's really good, then he can do everything, he's really perfectly good. How come there are so much evil in this world? If that kind of God really exists, how come he does not do anything about this evil? There's so much evil in this world, so much suffering and pain and problem. How come he does not do anything about it? I mean, especially days like this with all the stories and news of war and disasters, people question that. Now, one day, someone came to the pastor, Vadi Vakum, and asked a question. And Pastor Vadi replied in this way. He said, I'm not going to answer that question until you ask correctly. He says, ask you correctly? What do you mean, ask it correctly? You are not asking the question properly. Huh? What do you mean? It is my question. You cannot tell me how to ask my question. It's my question. Mm, I will answer your question when you ask properly. Fine. How do I ask properly? Here is how you ask it properly. You look in my eyes and ask, How on earth can a holy and righteous God, knowing what I did, what I thought, what I said, Yesterday, yet did not kill me in my sleep last night. You ask the question in that way, then we can talk. Until you ask the question in that way, you do not understand the issue. People seen as hostile in mind, engaging all evil deeds, creating all these masses, brokenness, and chaos, why God would not kill them right away. But he's displaying his perfect patience. Paul saying, when God showed the mercy even to a foremost worst person like me, and I was going to the completely opposite direction from what I, God had planned for me to be an apostle, Yet he still changed me and used me still as his apostle. He was not like, Paul, he killed my people, my children. Forget about my plan. I'm not going to use him as my apostle anymore. He did not do that. Yet he showed his grace towards me. Oh, let this be known to you as an example. That he will show you mercy, all those who come to him. He can, and he will change you. Let me end with this. Number three. Sure. Share your great story with others to his glory. That's the third thing we see from the text. Paul was saying, I was advancing in Judaism, not Jesus. 
I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. Um, it means that Paul was completely blind to the grace that was coming to him. He was completely blind to the grace that was from all eternity from heaven until Jesus Christ appeared to him and called him and changed him. That's why he was killing and persecuting Christians, right? He's talking about this so that it would be plain to us that him being an apostle was not Paul's idea. Oh, I'm going to be a Christian apostle one day. No. Otherwise, he would have never done that. Paul saying, what I am today, where I am today, is from him, completely from him, and by him, and because of him. God changed me upside down. He changed my life story, and I did not see it coming. I was completely blind. And some of you were probably like this. That some of you couldn't picture yourself being where you are today just a few years ago. Last year, five years ago, ten years ago. Me being a part of hope of glory or me being a Christian, believing in God, serving God. You could even picture yourself being like that. You say, I didn't imagine myself to be like this. I was completely blind to this grace that was coming to me. Your life story is a testimony of God's unfathomable grace. That story of grace can be all different. It is okay not to have a dramatic story. I know some people have a dramatic, how God changed me, how messed up I was, and he cleaned me and changed me. Some of you have just grew up in the Christian homes. But don't you think that is amazing grace towards you? That you believe in the Lord throughout your lifetime since you were little, isn't that a testimony of His faithfulness to you? Though you messed up a lot, He never forsook you. He never abandoned you. All of us have that great story. And I'm saying share that great story with other people. And that is what I want for our small group this month. Those of you who did not have a small group yet, that's what, nothing else. This is it. In your small group, not looking at some Bible passages and, you know, studying, no, not like that. Just go around in your small group and share God's grace story. What God did in your life. How He changed you. Or even simply how you came to hope of glory and grew up here and learned in the spirit of the Lord. Share that. Let me end by pointing this out from the text. All right? Look at the Bible. I'm, I'm done with this. Let me show you that I'm getting this from the scripture. Look at verse 22 to 24. And I'm done with this. And Paul says, I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. In other words, they did not know me personally. Christians in Judea did not know me personally. They only, verse 23, were hearing it, said they only heard about me. He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So they heard Paul's great story. And verse 24, and they glorified God because of me. Let your brothers and sisters give glory to God through your great story. Let's pray.